ask Alexandra to share her screen and we can get started. Great, thank you so much, Barbara. Uh, and thank you all for being here to listen to my presentation. I'm very excited to be back. So as um, Barbara was saying, it was about, I think it was more than a year ago, I think it might've been a year and a half um, yeah. when we came to present um, on the AHA study. Uh, and the AHA study is anal HPV, HCIL and aging study. Um, and we were presenting mostly to get feedback on how uh, to do recruitment because we were having a really hard time recruiting participants. We still are having a very hard time recruiting participants. So if anybody wants to refer someone to us, we're, we're happy to take them. Um, but it, within that, just trying to explain the AHA study, um, we found that there was a lot of interest um, about uh, human papillomavirus, HPV, anal cancer, uh, the HPV vaccine. Um, and we decided actually in response to um, the last meeting that I was at, we put, put together a community presentation that we're actually now giving um, as kind of a health education presentation. It also has some recruitment um, for our studies at the end. Uh, but this is the presentation we're now giving to various community organizations, um, doctor's offices, places like that, um, in, in order to help educate people about um, human papillomavirus, um, as well as doing a little bit of recruitment. So I, I wanted to share that presentation with you. Um, again, if you, I, I, I'm happy to stop and ask questions in the middle, um, but if you put them in the chat box, I, I won't be able to see them because I'm gonna make you, I'm on my laptop, so I'm gonna make you tiny so I can't see people. Um, and, uh, and then yeah, I Barbara can I'll stop. I'll keep me. up with you. Okay, <laughs> great. All right, so let me see if I can share my screen here. I'm going to, oops, this did not work, hold on. I'm going to, Oops, sorry, I just wanted to show you. Let me lean out of the way. This is our new logo, which is a, a peach, um, which is kind of a bottom um, with underwear on it. We have a bunch of different peaches of different colors with different underwear on them. Um, and that was also um, a direct result of feedback that we received from um, the cab last time that our uh, flyers were tired because they had these pictures of some over 50 men, which were uh, not uh, very attractive. So we changed to this. Um, and we're, we're very happy with our new peach. All right, now I'm going to go to the presentation and we'll share my this is over 50 here. men aren't attractive <laughs> no I think they're very attractive my partner's 54 um, so uh, but no the, the the images that we had apparently were not very attractive okay. I will say we are tired like physically <laughs> <laughs> we are all tired so right are. now yes Oops, let's go back. All right, so this is, uh, again, the community presentation that we um, put together. Um, it's supposed to be able to be given to any, any uh, level of person with, you know, they don't have to have any kind of healthcare background, um, and we'll walk them through human papillomavirus. So human papillomavirus, what is HPV? So you may, you probably heard about it before. Um, you've probably heard that it causes cervical cancer and there are now vaccines that are able, able to prevent it. Um, it's a virus, HPV is a virus that infects skin cells. Um, any person can get it, men, women, or people of all genders can get HPV. And it's extremely common. So if you look at this infographic over here on the side, it's from the CDC and it shows that 80% of all people will have some sort of human papillomavirus uh, infection at some point in their lives. So it's very common. All right, and how do you how do you get HPV? Well, you know we've heard so much about the coronavirus, and you're getting it through these particles in the air. Uh, HPV is not nearly that contagious. You actually need to have intimate skin-to-skin -skin contact um, to get HPV. Um, HPV also causes warts on your hands, so you can get it through you know touching someone's hand to get uh, that kind of. Uh, wart, um, but what we're talking about, what the cancers that we're most concerned about are anal genital cancers. So you have to have um, sexual contact. That's usually the way that you have the most intimate skin to skin contact is through sex. Um, and any kind of sex can transmit HPV, vaginal, anal, or oral. And if you get HPV, see if I can move this out of the way. Okay, so if you get an HPV infection, what happens? So what happens now you're infected, what happens? Well, for almost everybody, absolutely nothing happens. 
for these most, the vast majority of people, you have no symptoms and you probably don't even know you're infected and your body takes care of it without causing you any concern. For a smaller number of people, um, the there are certain types that cause genital warts um, and you can have genital warts, anogenital warts, um, they can be uncomfortable, um, you might need to have them removed, but they don't usually progress to cancer. So it's not um, that uh, important, not, not that it's not important, but it's not um, as crucial um, as cancer. And then in some rare cases with some specific types of HPV, uh, they can progress into cancer. But that's a rare occurrence. Oops, I'm not getting an advancement. There we go. So women can get HPV cancers that are caused by HPV. Um, you can get them at the base of the tongue or the tonsils. So that's a, a common area that you can have uh, an HPV infection. Um, you can have a cervical infection, a vulvar infection, a vaginal infection, and then you can also have an anal infection. And again, it's in the skin of any of those places. And what about men? Do you think that men can get HPV infections? Well, yes, they can. They can also get um, HPV infections. And just like women, they can get them at the base of the tongue and the tonsils, um, but they can also get them in the penis, which is a little bit more rare, and in the anus, which is not as rare. So who's at risk for getting anal cancer that's caused by HPV? Well, really, I mean, anybody with a butt is at risk of getting um, anal cancer, but it's pretty rare. And most people are at very low risk. But there are some high risk groups where we're a little bit more concerned that they might develop anal cancer um, from an HPV infection. And I'm just gonna go through the four most common groups um, that are at higher risk of developing anal cancer. So the first one is HIV positive men who have sex with men. The second risk group is HIV negative men who have sex with men. Then we have HIV positive women. And then HIV negative women who've had cervical HPV. So cervical HPV can migrate to the anus. And if you've already had an infection, you're much more likely to get a different one. All right, so I wanted to put this into perspective for you. Um, and I'm gonna talk about numbers here. Um, and I'm just gonna walk through this slide slowly, but just to give you an idea of what kind of, uh, of what magnitude we're talking about with anal cancer. So this is cancer incidence in men um, over a one year period. And the way that we measure it is per 100,000 people in the, po in the population. And this is um, um, among men, so it's per 100,000 men. And this bar here is for prostate cancer in the general population. And prostate cancer is the most common cancer in men of all ages. When they're all grouped together, it's prostate cancer. So if you followed 100,000 men for one year, you would expect 113 of them to develop prostate cancer. So that's a small amount, it's rare. Cancer is rare, um, but that's, that's the most common one is 113 per 100,000 per year. The next most common is uh, lung cancer, and that's at 64 per 100,000 per year. And the next most common is colon and rectal cancer, which is different from cancer. All right, so in comparison here, if we now look at the population of men who are infected with HIV, so now we're following 100,000 people who are men and also infected with HIV, their rate of anal cancer is 131 per 100,000. So it's still a small amount. I, I grant you that it's still a small amount. However, it's much higher than prostate cancer in the general population. And to give you a, just a tiny bit more context, here is cervical cancer in women. So if you followed 100,000 women for one year in the United States, 7.4 of them would develop um, cervical cancer. And we're asking all women of certain reproductive ages to get screened for cervical cancer. We're telling all girls who are, you know, 10 and between 20 and 12 to get vaccinated for human papillomavirus um, to prevent this cervical cancer. So we need to be thinking about the, the difference here in magnitude um, in these high risk groups of who are at high risk for anal cancer. We should be doing something for them. And of course, that's what, that's what we're here doing. All right, so the good news is, is that there now is a vaccine. 
um, and this is kind of an amazing turn of events. It's been, uh, it's been on the market for a while now. Um, there's still not great uh, uptake of the vaccine. Um, it's recommended for all girls and boys, 11 to 12. Um, if you miss it as a preteen, they are still doing some catch-up vaccines. Um, and now it's approved in men who have sex with men up to 45. So you can go and have a conversation with your doctor. And if he believes it's um, a good idea, uh, that you can get a, a vaccine uh, before your age 45. Um, it's most effective before you start any sexual activity. So before you get any contact with the human papillomavirus. And that's why it's recommended for boys and girls at this young age. So there absolutely can be cases where there's, um, it's, it's more recommended for an, an older age group based on that criteria. And then so HPV I'm, vaccines, I'm sorry, go ahead. I have a question. So yes. what, what are some of the barriers you said that is not, the uptake is low? Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, are you guys aware of, you know, the reasons for that? Um, I think they're different for different populations. Um, this, particularly in that young age group, parents are very hesitate, hesitant to vaccinate for a sexually transmitted infection. Um, you know, the, the feedback we often hear is, you know, my child is not sexually active, so they don't need that vaccine. Um, you know, that, uh, yeah, so that's a lot of what I hear. Uh, it's also, you know, it used to be a three-part vaccine. Now it's two, getting any kind of preteen back into the doctor multiple times to get a vaccine, and it hurts. Um, this is the, my, my daughter just recently had it, and it, it hurts your arm. It's one of those ones that is going to be a struggle to get her back in for her second dose. So those are some of the reasons why. Um, and, and then it, and it, it can yes, I ahead. ask something real quick? Yes, There's absolutely. No um, I, I think my experience is that the whole education at the beginning of this whole uh, vaccination uh, period for teenagers was that only only women were being vaccinated. So it is kind of cultural that we don't we don't even we don't even talk about HPV on men, and so there's a lot of misinformation or not education at all about it. Uh, for the male population. I think right. that's more my... Absolutely. So, yes. So, in, in the beginning, it was only approved for, for girls, period. It wasn't approved for men. That came later. Um, and then uh, it was marketed more as a, it would be good for you to not give HPV to your partner. That's why you would want to be vaccinated. Um, it, I think now it has really expanded. I'm hoping that, that that message is getting out there, that it prevents many types of cancer or many types of HPV infection that could lead to many different you know, areas where you can get cancer. Um, and definitely among men, it prevents cancer. Um, there are many different types of um, cancers that men can get from HPV. Is there another question? I was going to ask, I mean, you know, is there any sort of like intervention that minimizes the pain? Um, uh, I, immediately afterwards? I mean, I don't know. Like, absolutely. All those things. I mean, there, there are other shots that cause that are, are not comfortable to get. Uh, yeah. That's probably not the, the no, that's probably not the biggest yeah. barrier. Um, but yeah, absolutely. There, you can take some Tylenol, apply some ice. Uh, those things are usually quite helpful um, for, for the pain. Um, it's more of the uh, perception, I think, with the preteens of getting uh, uh, getting that painful shot and getting back in for that second one. Yeah, no, my my oldest is due. Right. And they're very sensitive to shots, so we're. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I know exactly where. It's very funny because I'm an HPV researcher and I'm having you know the trouble getting my daughter to get her HPV vaccine. It's a uh, uh, ironic, um, but but yes, I, I understand. And you know, again, having an intervention, I, I would not have known this until I became a parent of a, a middle school child. But having uh, an, a, an intervention that has to happen in middle school is challenging because of where they are developmentally. Um, so yes, but we need to get them in to get their shots. Having them at school. Um, is one of the things that has been very successful in other countries. Uh, we don't do HPV vaccines at school here, um, but Australia, for example, 
um, some countries in Africa, uh, they just show up at the school and they, you know, vaccinate everybody with consent. Um, and again, for a lot of reasons, you get, you end up catching a lot of people at the, at the schools. Um, and uh, if you see all of your peers getting the vaccine, it's normalized and you, know, you, you are more likely to get it. So that's another, another. Uh, um, this is, this is Carolyn. I have a question. Hi. Sure. Are you seeing, are you, are you seeing any um, barriers when it comes to um, parents not believing in vaccines? You know, there's this whole movement of not getting anti, your child anti-vaxxers. Yeah, anti. Anti-vaxxer. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, I haven't, I mean, I, I'm sure it, it plays a role in the HPV vaccine. I haven't seen much literature on HPV vaccine um, specifically for anti-vaxxers. It's more for the, the smaller kids and the, um, and the vaccines that they're not getting um, for measles, mumps, and rubella and that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but I'm well, sure, well, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah, but, yeah, but I'm just wondering because those, because those ch children, the first wave of that um, you know, the anti-vaccine, those children are now entering into puberty. Into the middle school so, ages, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm one, you know, I think that might be something to think about. That's really interesting. I, I, I don't know if that's been looked at or not, but I will take a look because that is actually very interesting, an, an interesting thing to um, think about right now, if there's going to be a, a new dip in, um, in uptake. Uh, because of anti-vaxxers who are growing up. And I don't think the HPV is required, vac vaccine is required, um, like some of the other ones, um, the pneumococcal vaccine, for example, is required for school entry, but the HPV vaccine isn't. So it might be an additional reason not to get it. Okay, is, are there any other questions before I move on? All right, so I'm just going to move on. So the vaccine is wonderful. I love vaccines. They're my favorite public, public health intervention. Um, but, uh, you know, you might not have gotten your vaccine because it didn't come out well when you were 12 or, or under. Um, or, you know, you, you had anti-vaxxer parents and you didn't get to get your vaccine and now you've been sexually active and now you're worried. Maybe you're in a high-risk group and you're worried about um, getting um, cancers caused by HPV. So is there anything that you can do? Absolutely, you can get screened for anal cancer. So I'm going to bear with me as I walk you through kind of a little natural history here of um, HPV infection to anal cancer. And we'll talk about where, um, where you can, uh, different places in this natural history where we can prevent anal cancer. Um, so you start off usually by having some sort of sexual activity that exposes you to HPV, and then you get uh, HPV infection. And uh, m there are many different types of HPV, only some of them cause um, anal or cause any kind of cancer. And the most common types are HPV 16 and 18. Those are some of the types that are included in the vaccines. Um, but those are the types that can uh, give you an infection that could lead to a cancer. But before it gets to, um, before it develops into a cancer, it can develop into what we call precancerous lesions. So the skin cell in and around your anus, if it's for anal cancer, but it works very similarly for cervical cancer, um, can develop a lesion. And that lesion, if it goes, you know, for several years, can eventually develop into an anal cancer, and that's what's here. So the second type of prevention that we can do for anal cancer and cervical cancer, again, this is done with a pap smear um, all the time. We, we do this for women all the time for the cervix, but we can screen for these precancerous lesions. So we can look for the lesions in a clinic, and if we have a, uh, if we find the lesions, then we can treat them. Um, what we were just talking about, the HPV vaccine, that happens upstream of these lesions and upstream of infection. So you, if you use the vaccine, you can prevent an infection from happening at all. Um, and uh, but if you've missed that step, if you've missed it and you have an infection, then you can prevent it um, by looking for these lesions. All right, so. You can, uh, I can't see this. So anal cancer, it's not yet, uh, screening for anal cancer is not yet standard of care. So for cervical cancer, you know, since the 1960s, it's been, um, 
standard of care to look for these lesions and treat them. And we have lowered the incidence of cervical cancer in developed countries, you know, just to set, we were just looking at it, it's, it's only seven per 100,000 now, and that was down from these over 100 um, incidences um, in the 1960s. So it's, it's an amazing, again, public health intervention. Um, it's been amazingly successful, but we don't have evidence yet um, that it, if you do the same thing with anal cancers, if you treat those precancerous lesions, that they're going to, um, that it's going to prevent anal cancer. Of course, that's what we believe, but we have to have um, evidence. Uh, we need to do a study and have evidence that that is the, tr the, the truth before we go on and make it the standard of care. Um, so uh, what we would do, what we do is um, screen for anal cancer. And here's just a picture of some of the instrument that we use to screen for anal cancer. So again, anal cancer is pretty rare. So not everybody needs to come in and get screened. It's not like with cervical cancer that we want all women to go in to get screened. But in those four high risk groups, um, we do want you to come in and get screened um, more, more often than um, someone that's not in one of these groups. So again, if you're HIV positive and an MSM, we really want you to come in kind of any time and start, um, start a, a relationship with a doctor who's going to do anal, can anal cancer screening to you kind of over your lifetime. If you're an HIV negative M MSM, after you're 40, we're asking you to come in. And these um, recommendations are from the Anchor Clinic. So it's the clinic that um, the AHA study is run out of. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then if you're an HIV positive woman or an HIV negative woman who has a history of surgical HPV, check with your doctor. Now, of course, there are other people who are at high risk. Um, they're not necessarily a high risk group, but they're individuals who can be at high risk. You can be immune, immune compromised for other reasons. Um, so anybody, if you have a concern, you should check with your doctors and you can eval evaluate whether or not it's a good idea to get screened for anal cancer. All right, so the way that you would get screened is with um, an exam called a high resolution anoscopy or HRA for short. Um, it's just the best way that we have of looking for these lesions. It's uh, similar um, uh, to what they do for cervical cancer. Um, and then once we find that there's a precancerous lesion, we can biopsy it and confirm that it's one of these lesions that needs to be uh, looked at. And then when we find a lesion, we can treat it. So we can treat it with a number of different um, avenues um, that will basically remove the lesion in one way or another from the anus. Again, very similar to what happens with cervical cancer. And we're incredibly- question, Yes. Alex, does a, a colonoscopy include, do, do they screen for anal cancer during that? That is an incredibly important question. And no, it does not. So we're actually one of our um, one of our uh, new campaigns is going into colonoscopy clinics um, and asking them to refer their folks uh, to us to get screened for anal cancer because we've definitely heard that feedback where people say, well, I already had my colonoscopy, so doesn't it chain you know check the entire um, colon all the way down through the rectum and anus, and it doesn't. So you have to have this very specific exam um, to look for anal cancer. Um, and here at UCSF, we have the Anchor Clinic that's uh, the, spelled A-N-C-R-E, and that stands for Anal Neoplasia Clinic Research and Education Center. Or, yeah, Research and Education Center. Um, and this is, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, it's Ramon. It was hard for me to hear the question, and you heard, you said it was very important. Can, no. can you <laughs> yes, absolutely. So the question was, um, does a colonoscopy screen for anal cancer? And the answer is that it does not, um, which is very important. We've heard that from um, a lot of participants. We also did um, a focus group, um, a, a series of focus groups, and it was a very common belief uh, that people thought, oh, I'm, I'm good, I'm covered, I've already had my colonoscopy, but it doesn't. We have to have this very specific uh, way of looking at the anus and seeing if there's a lesion there or not. So again, Dr. Joel Pilewski, he is the person who presented last time on the AHA study. So he's the director of this clinic and he founded this clinic about 25 years ago with Michael and Naomi here who are pictured here. Um, and they're really kind of at the forefront of screening and treating anal cancer um, in the world. Uh, and the Anchor Clinic, the mission of the clinic, and this is where the AHA study lives and the 
clinic here. Um, it's to provide screening, diagnosis, treatment, and treatment of HPV-associated anal disease in men and women in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, although we have people who come in from all over the state, really, uh, to get treated. Um, they're also a big... Uh, Part of the mission is education for patients and providers. So we train a lot of providers on uh, how to do this exam so they can go to back to their countries or back to their home states and continue providing screening. Um, and then there's also a lot of research that starts at the Anchor Clinic, although we have international studies, uh, so we're associated with the clinic, but it might be happening all over the world. So uh, again, here's the Anchor Clinic. They have a clinic that we just see patients for um, patient you know, diagnosis, treatment, and screening. Um, they have their education, and then we have the Center for Research. So there are a lot of studies going on here. The big one that you may have heard of before is the ANCHOR study, um, which is spelled A-N-C-H-O-R, as opposed to the ANCHOR clinic. Um, and this is a very uh, important study that I'll tell you about in a second. Um, and it's a randomized controlled trial of treatment versus no treatment for anal cancer. And then the AHA study, which is the study that I'm um, an investigator on uh, where that's looking at aging HPV and um, HIV. And then there are a lot of other studies about treatments and some therapeutic vaccines and looking at the microbiome. There's a lot of interesting work that's going on there. But I'll just talk to you about the two largest studies that are going on there today. All right, so the first one is the ANCHOR study, and the study really is for HIV positive um, people, so men and women can join this study. Um, there, it's like, as I was saying before, it's a randomized control trial, and the aim of the trial is to see if everybody who is in the study has one of those lesions. They have one of those precancerous lesions. So half of them are being enrolled into treatment, and half of them are being enrolled into a group that gets very close monitor, very closely monitored follow-up, so they don't get treatment. And then at the end of the study, the, what the hypothesis is that in the group of men that gets treated for those precancerous lesions, there's going to be a lower incidence of anal cancer than in the group who does not get treated. Um, and one of the questions that I always get from my students when I describe the study, because I, uh, I teach epidemiology, um, is, is that ethical? Is it ethical to uh, follow these men um, waiting for them to develop cancer in this control group? And it, it is because we don't, we don't know whether or not treatment helps. It's possible that we get to the end of the study and the incidence in, this, in both groups is the same. And we're putting men through a painful, uh, you know, procedure to treat the anal lesions and it has absolutely no impact. Um, the other uh, very important thing about the study is that they get very closely monitored. Um, so if they do develop anal cancer, they catch it extremely early and the prognosis for anal cancer when they catch it early is um, very good. So it's, um, it is a very important and very well-designed study. All right, so again, the reason that we're doing it is because we know that cervical can treating cervical cancer, uh, pre-cancers pre um, prevent cervical cancer, so we believe the same is true for anal cancer. Um, if you are interested or if you know anybody who you think would be good for this study, um, these are the eligibility criteria. So it's men, women, and transgendered people. They have to be over 35. Everybody's HIV positive. Again, we wanted those people in the highest, highest um, risk group. Uh, they need to have one of these precancerous lesions, but that would be um, diagnosed at the screening visit. So you don't know if you have one of those uh, precancerous visits until you come in and get that HRA exam. Um, it's okay if you've already had one, but you can't, it's already okay if you've already had a precancerous lesion, but if you've had anal cancer, then you don't qualify for the study. If you want any more information on that, um, the anchorstudy.org is the website and here, this is the phone number and I can have these slides um, sent to, to Barbara if anybody's interested in having this contact information. Thank you. Sure. Um, and then the study that's my baby, <laughs> the one that I've been working on uh, for very many years now is called the AHA study. And again, it's anal HPV, HIV and aging. Um, and here's another one of our, our peach, our, the, uh, our peach um, uh, 
our, our peach emoji uh, recruitment strategy um, where we're talking about anal cancer and any uh, all these butts are supposed to represent or the peaches are supposed to represent everybody's little butt in every color and shape and size um, needs to be screened if you're in one of those high risk groups. So this study is important because, as I said before, we know that HIV positive people are at risk for anal cancer. We know that if you get older, you get more um, anal cancer. That's true of almost any cancer, um, except for the childhood ones. At the older you get, the more likely you, know, you're, you are to get one of these cancers. So what we don't know, because we haven't been in the situation before, um, now a lot of people who are living with HIV and AIDS um, are aging, they're getting older, um, and this is new for us, so we don't know if there's more anal disease in people who are co-infected with HPV and HIV and getting older. Um, we don't know if it develops faster. So for example, if you have HIV and you're older, maybe you'll get it in your 50s instead of getting it in your 60s or 70s. Um, and we don't know if, like, if it's going to be, you know, a worse, uh, like a larger lesion or harder to treat if you're aging and ha have HIV. So the AHA study um, is looking for uh, men who are over the age of 50, um, who uh, have sex with some men or trans people who are over the age of uh, 50 who have sex with other men. Um, and you can be HIV positive or HIV neg negative because we wanted to have a comparison group to see um, if the men who have HIV are even more at higher risk than the HIV negative men. Um, the AHA study visits are pretty much all the same. So it's, you have a baseline visit and then if you qualify for the follow-up, you'll be followed up for three years. Um, you do a questionnaire on a computer, you do a walk test and a grip strength test, which are some ways of evaluating biological aging. Um, you tend to walk slower and have a less uh, powerful grip um, as you get older. We'll also take some blood to look at markers of inflammation, for example, um, and also your HIV status, um, disease status in your blood uh, CD4 count and HIV viral load. Um, and then we also do this anal exam. All right, so here we get to the tricky part of, the, of my presentation because I want to show you. Oh, look, it's showing up in everything. Let's see if this is going to work. Um, we have a couple of questions. Oh, okay. Um, Alex. So one is how long is the AHA study uh, funded for? And the other one is do uh, participants receive incentives and what are they? Yes, well, great questions. Um, so the AHA study was initially funded for five years. We um, got permission to extend it to a sixth year. So we're in the fifth year, but we're gonna go on for one more year. Um, because the recruitment has been so slow. And yes, so participants receive about $100 a visit. So it can be a little bit more if they're doing a, some, some extra stuff. So there's a, some sub-studies that can make it so you're um, uh, earning a little bit more if you have a different... Um, if you have a different blood draw that's happening, um, or if you have to come in multiple times, sometimes you have to repeat a, a, a test because it didn't work, um, but it's about $100 a visit. Is that, um, is that the, sorry, did I answer all of those questions? Okay, so let me go back to my share screen. I'm going to try to share my sound, which may make my mic turned off, um, but what I, what I want to, what I want to show you here is, um, this is Dr. Joel Pilevsky explaining that anal exam because this anal exam is a little bit, uh, can be um, a little scary uh, when we talk about it. So it's, uh, this, I think this is a really nice way uh, for participants to learn about um, the, the exam. Okay, so I'm gonna share my sound, which might make me go um, mute. So there is one other question while you do that. Can you and hear me? I can hear you. Oh, excellent. Okay, so I can answer the question. Yeah, is do you have any data uh, of the five years that you've uh, already uh, been involved? Uh, yes, and I don't think that I um, I'm, I'm ready to share it um, because we did do some preliminary work, uh, but I would like to get more people enrolled just in case um, it doesn't turn out, you know, when I get my full sample, it, it doesn't turn out that those are valid. Um, but I will say that um, I'm excited to be doing this study. So, yes. And um, 
uh, one of the plans that I have is to put together um, like a newsletter or something with results as soon as we start actually putting together results and that will go out on our Facebook um, and I can share that with you um, as soon as we do have some stuff. As soon as we start present presenting at, um, uh, you know, uh, scholarly meetings and that kind of thing, I, I'm happy to present to share that. Okay, let's see if this works now. And Barbara, let me know if you can't hear. Hi, that. Ryan. I'm uh, Joel Polevsky. I'm an investigator of the AHA study, and I want to thank you so much for your interest in the study. Uh, what I thought I'd do is just show you what we're going to do for the anal examination. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Great. So we're going to start with um, the insertion of a swab. This swab, this is for anal cytology, also known as a pap smear. Uh, we'll also do some other tests on the material taken from this swab. To make it a little more comfortable for you, I'm going to moisten it a little bit, but I don't have any lubricant on here. Everything I do after this swab can have lubricant, but not this particular test. So this may be the most uncomfortable part of the examination. I'm going to be having you position yourself on the table and when you're on the table on your left side, I'm going to have you help me a little bit by lifting your right cheek with your right hand. So it's just so I can insert the swab comfortably. Okay. And then once the swab is in, I'll have you let go and then I will do my thing. What that is principally is my uh, inserting the swab as far as it'll go. That's usually about this far. Okay. And then I'll be twirling it to collect cells from the surface of the anal canal. Um, That'll take about 30 seconds or so, and is moderately, or mildly, I'd say, uncomfortable. Not very, but, but a little weird feeling, mostly. Once that's done, I'll remove this swab from your anal area, and then I'll insert it into this jar, and then I'm going to do a very loud swishing sound to try and get all the cells that I collected off into the liquid in this jar. Mm -hmm. Then we'll send it off to the laboratory for examination. Once I finish swishing the cells in there, uh, we'll proceed with the next part of the examination, which is a digital anorectal examination. Here I take lubricant with lidocaine on my gloved finger, and then I'll insert my finger slowly, gently, and sweep my finger around to feel for lumps and bumps that could be indicative of any problems, uh, warts, um, sometimes hemorrhoids, sometimes uh, normal um, bumps and lumps that occur in the anal canal, and very, very rarely cancer. We're primarily doing the exam to feel for hard things that could indicate cancer. <clears throat> Once I've completed that part of the examination, I'll remove my finger. That typically only takes about a minute or less. And then I'll begin the part of the test that we call high-resolution anoscopy. This is a test that's designed to help us see changes on the surface of the anal canal and the outside part uh, with very great um, precision using the magnifying lens of this uh, colposcope. Okay. I'm not going to be putting this inside, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what I will be doing is uh, inserting this small plastic anoscope inside after okay. I put lots of lube on it. Okay. Once I put it inside, mm -hmm. I'm going to remove this part of it. This is called the obturator. And through the anoscope, I'm then going to be inserting this vinegar-soaked swab, okay. and then pulling this out over it to leave the vinegar-soaked swab sitting in your anal area for about a minute or minute to two minutes. Okay. Here, uh, it shouldn't be painful, but it might again feel a little weird. It'll feel cold, and you might feel like you want to go to the bathroom but that's uh, not going to happen. Okay. That's a normal feeling. After about a minute to two minutes, I'll be pulling the swab out and then reinserting the anoscope with the obturator in. And uh, this is when the actual examination begins. I'm going to pull this out and then look through the scope using this scope like that. I will be projecting the images onto a computer you're welcome to watch if you want. If you don't want to, you don't have to. And then um, I'll be slowly withdrawing the scope uh, to look for all the changes that might be there. After I've 
finish looking with the vinegar, I might be applying another stain, which is called Lugol's iodine here. Okay. And that also helps us pick out changes that might indicate the presence of a possible precancerous uh, lesion in the anus. Uh, if we see any changes that might indicate the presence of some of these changes, we'll want to confirm those by taking a tissue sample or a biopsy. It's very small, about the size of a sesame seed, and most of the time it doesn't really hurt. Um, if the changes are more towards the outside, including the outside area of the anus, then that is more sensitive, and if we need to take a biopsy from those areas, then I will do a small injection with lidocaine to make it numb okay. before we actually do the biopsy. Again, it's relatively uh, well tolerated, uh, not a big problem. Um, so the whole examination will take maybe about 10-15 minutes uh, from start to finish. And um, when you leave, you should be feeling fine. Uh, the only thing that you may notice is if you've had a biopsy, you might have some very light bleeding for a couple of days after a bowel movement. Um, but um, it's a very safe procedure with very low rates of problems. <coughs> Um, that's basically high resolution anoscopy. Uh, do you have any questions, Brian? Um, I don't think so. So you said most people don't have pain, but it might be uncomfortable. That's right. Um, just kind of like, like pressure? I'll just feel... Yes, it can feel like pressure sometimes, and the vinegar can sometimes cause a little bit of stinging. Okay. Like I mentioned, sometimes People feel like they might want to have a bowel movement, mm -hmm. but that's not really going to happen. That's just the vinegar doing okay. that. Um, and uh, most of the time, people don't have any pain when they leave the, uh, the examination. Okay. And I could go. I'm going to stop it there because it, it does go on a little bit more that it doesn't have, is not uh, that crucial for us to watch. Um, are there any questions on the video before? Thanks. I think I'm gonna... Great video. Thank you. Um, okay, escape. Let's see if I. There we go. Whoops. That's not what I wanted to happen. Either. You have a question. What's your safe? Uh, I'm sorry, it went away. Where Where am I? Um. What's your safe sex messaging after the exam? Uh, um, yeah. So we usually ask you if you've had a biopsy not to have um, receptive anal sex for two weeks after you've had um, a biopsy because it does uh, leave an open, um, an open uh, area uh, because we've, we've removed some tissue. So the doctors counsel um, the participants not to have receptive anal sex for um, a couple of, couple of weeks. And then there's a statement, there's data from Europe that HIV positive MS, MF, MSM are at greater risk of sexual transmission of hepatitis C uh, following anal wart removal and Dr. P's line about uh, blood made me think about it. Um, that's a good point. I'm not sure if I've, um, if I've uh, heard about that before. Um, Certainly, if uh, you're refraining from um, receptive anal sex, that should help with HCV transmission as well. Um, and um, I think it's part of all of our um, messaging in the clinic. Uh, condoms are always um, recommended for any, for any sexual behavior. It's part of the messaging that happens in the clinic. Um, but that's a good point, and I'm going to just write down to look at I could send you the see. article. Oh, that'd be great. I just It's called The Trouble with Bleeding, which is like the greatest mm -hmm. journal ever. Right. But, no, I think your two-week message is awesome because yep. I don't think there's any consensus out there. And, you know, sometimes anal wart removal is relatively gentle, but sometimes it's really quite deep and there can be right. a lot of blood. Right. People who do engage in condomless receptive anal sex are at increased risk for HIV. And like I said, there's some data to suggest Hepatitis C. Hepatitis. And other sexually transmitted infections as well. So, so yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you. So just for 
everybody's um, uh, information, um, we have these two great studies going on, but you don't have to be a participant in any study to be screened for anal cancer. Um, so if you or a loved one or a friend uh, just want to come in and get screened, you can just directly call the anchor clinic and this is the phone number um, and you could be um, assessed for that. I think I missed a, yeah, I just, I did miss a slide. So I, uh, I will go back to this slide. And this is just, if you, if you are interested in the AHA study, or if you know somebody who might be interested in the AHA study, um, you can find out that if you're eligible by calling us, um, we have a website called ahastudy.org. Um, you can email us at ahastudy at ucsf.edu. And then we also have a Facebook um, campaign. Um, if anybody would like to go onto our Facebook page and like us now, we're going to be coming up with a, a new campaign um, that's going to try to uh, link some COVID-19 and HIV uh, information and anal cancer together. So we'll be, be as, as soon as we get uh, IRB approval for that, uh, we're going to start sending some messages about um, HIV, COVID-19, and other things uh, through our Facebook page. So if it's the AHA study, if you want to look for it on your Facebook, or again, recommend it to um, friends or family who might be interested in, in, in the AHA study. All right, and that is the end of the what I have for the presentation. I want to say thank you from everybody on the AHA study team, and this is just a picture of all of us from uh, the Anchor Clinic. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, my email is alexander.hernandez at ucsf.edu. Um, you can also reach me again at, at the Facebook, um, the Facebook address. Um, and we have some additional resources. Again, I can so send this um, presentation to Barbara uh, in case um, you want to look at any of these um, information, uh, informational sites. And then I think we do have a little extra time. Oh, barely any, but we have a little time um, left for questions if anybody wants I, to. I just wanted to say while it's on my mind, Alexander, sure. that um, we are recording this and probably will, um, um, you know, encourage other CAB members to look at it. Sure. I uh, just wanted to make sure that's okay with you. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. So we do have time for questions and then we're going to do a little survey before we move to our CAB meeting. So about what? Um, three minutes for questions. Um, anybody? Um, this is Carolyn. Um, would you be open to presenting to the HIV and Aging Committee for the State of California Office of AIDS? I would absolutely love to. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, if yeah, I can uh, either I can if you have my email, I can try to send it in the chat screen. And then question here, this Ramon, um, have you uh, reached out to? Uh, the clinics that were doing the um, um, anal screening before, because my at case at Kaiser, at Kaiser, and I think there's like one or two more uh, clinics. Not many in the city. Is that correct? We yeah, we have um, a very interesting problem with the AHA study. Is that um, because uh, at UCSF and our at our clinic, anal cancer screening is considered standard of care at the clinic not overall, but at the clinic, we need to charge it to insurance. So we actually can't see Kaiser patients because they have, um, they, it, Kaiser has their own in-house screening that they want to have happen um, in, you know, at Kaiser, which makes sense, of course. Um, I've always thought, like, how can we get Kaiser involved so that we can somehow, um, we can somehow benefit each other, right? Can, if there's some way to work that out, um, but we have yet to do it. So maybe Ramon, if you could, uh, if you have any, any ideas on how we could um, make, uh, make it work between Kaiser and UCSF that way, um, I'd be interested in and open to trying to facilitate and, and, that. And you guys uh, reimburse, or we, we can talk about it. Let's, let's chat a little bit. I, my idea is uh, sometimes we are so, uh, they're so backed up that I think it will be very good idea to, uh, right. you know, work together. Yeah, let's, yeah, we, let's chat. Yeah, I think it's just about that reimbursement. If we could get Kaiser to, gotcha. to pay, yeah, that would be, it would be amazing because we have a yeah. long list of Kaiser part participants who we are not able to enroll because they have Kaiser. Mm, so, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, mm -hmm. 
Do we have any other questions? If not, we're gonna do the survey and move on to our next meeting. I, I just wanna make a, a, a statement that uh, I really enjoyed the presentation. It was Thank a you. wonderful presentation and I know that I learned a lot. Thank you, I really appreciate that. Um, and thank you all for, for attending and for giving me your time.